via email. And now I'd like to give a warm welcome to Brene Smith, Data Project Assistant for Acquisitions, and Dr. Shane Redman, um, Senior Project Manager, also for Acquisitions. Shane and Brene, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Lynette. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the presentation on finding and accessing data at ICPSR. Uh, we're very glad that you joined us today. As Lynette mentioned, uh, I'm a senior data project manager here at ICPSR, and I primarily work on the data acquisitions team for the General Archive. Um, and I'm joined, of course, by my co-host, um, Brene Smith. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Brene Smith, and I am a data project assistant on the acquisitions team here at ICPSR. Okay, so here are the things that Brene and I will cover with you today. Um, so first, I'm going to provide a quick overview of our various archives at ICPSR. Uh, next, Brene will walk you through our website and discuss um, how to search and find data through ICPSR. And then I'll discuss how to actually access the data once you've found um, the data on our website. And as part of that discussion, I'll discuss some of the differences between accessing public use data versus restricted use data. And then we'll conclude with um, questions from you all. Okay, so to start, um, I'll briefly go over the various archives that we have here at ICPSR. Some of you may be familiar with this stuff already, but for those of you who are newer to ICPSR, um, this might provide some context for when these things um, come up in future conversations related to our, our various archives here at ICPSR. So for our current ICPSR holdings um, and our whole catalog, um, these are kind of what just some broad numbers look like. So we have over 16,000 studies um, or data collections in total. We have nearly 6 million variables that are searchable on our website. And Brene will show you um, in a little bit how you can search for variables. And we have over 98,000 publications in our searchable bibliography. And so these are publications in which the data from those 16,000 studies have been used. And again, Brene will show you a little bit what this looks like on our website shortly. So over the years, um, the scope of the data acquisitions have, at ICPSR has expanded to include data from many different di disciplines. Essentially, if the data are have any connection to humans or their experience or existence within societies, uh, we're probably interested in the data. So of course, we have lots of data from the social and behavioral sciences, and we define those very broadly. Um, but our data collections also come from the health and medical sciences, as well as the rehabilitation sciences. Um, and we've grown to accept a number of different data formats. So um, we have the most experience, of course, with our quantitative, uh, mostly survey type data, um, as well as text data. But we also have some geospatial data or GIS data. We have video data and images. We have sensor data. Um, we have brain scan images like MRIs and EEG data as well. Um, so we kind of have uh, all sorts of different formats and are always expanding in, in that um, case as well. We're most known, most well known for, I think, our large scale survey, national survey type studies. Um, but we accept data from kind of smaller uh, one time studies as well. So um, it, it, a study doesn't have to be at the national scale for us to accept it into our archive. Um, and additionally, we um, have the ability to handle uh, restricted use data in addition to, of course, public use data. Okay, so we have three kind of um, types of archives at ICPSR. And I'll talk about each of these in turn in the following slides. Um, we have a number of topical archives. Um, we have our general archive, our also you might hear it referred to as our membership archive. And then we have Open ICPSR. Um, Open ICPSR differs from the other archives in that the data in Open ICPSR are not curated, uh, whereas the data in all of the other archives at ICPSR are curated by ICPSR staff. And so when we talk about data curation at ICPSR, these are just some of the tasks that our curators do um, to our data collections that get curation. Um, essentially, our curation enhances the data for discoverability and usability by secondary users. 
Um, so one thing the data curators do is perform a disclosure risk review of the data. Um, and this goes to the, determine whether the data files can be public use or restricted use. Um, they also do things like standardize missing data, check for outliers. Um, uh, they make sure that the study is very discoverable um, by ensuring the metadata record is thorough and complete. They produce a standardized ICPSR codebook, um, and the data basically undergo um, a number of quality checks and then are disseminated in the major statistical packages. Um, these are not all of the curation tasks that we do at ICPSR. And indeed, we have different levels of curation. Um, so, so some studies might get some additional tasks um, that other studies do not. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about curation, I know there's a session happening tomorrow morning, I believe, um, all about data curation at ICPSR. And um, there will also be some data curators with a virtual booth in that session tomorrow as well, if you're interested in finding out more and talking to these um, people at ICPSR. Okay, so I mentioned our topical archives, and at any given point in time, um, ICPSR can have 15 or so or more topical archives. Um, and these archives really serve the needs of distinct research communities uh, or sponsors. So they're mostly funded by external sponsors, and all of the data in our topical archives are curated. So they get the curation services, as I mentioned, um, and they're all made available to secondary users at no cost. So this is just a screenshot on the slide at the bottom of our uh, topical collections that we currently have. This is just taken from the main ICPSR website. And if you go to the main site, um, you can click on all of these logos and it will take you to that topical archives website. So each of these have their own website. Um, so we have uh, a range of archives. So HIMCA, for example, HMCA is the health and medical care archive. NACJD is the Criminal Justice Data Archive, ADEF is the Archive for Data on Disability, um, and so there are all sorts of other um, topical archives that I encourage you to check out when you have time. And then we have our general archive, and again, it might be referred to as the membership archive. Um, so this is our, our archive that is funded by our membership, basically, um, and this is for any data that cannot go into a topical archive. So because the topical archives are funded by external sponsors, there are some limitations on the types of data that can go into those archives. Um, HIMCA, for example, is only for data that has been funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Um, so not all data can go into just any topical archive. Um, the external funders have a say in what data they want to basically pay to curate. Um, and so for anything that doesn't go into a topical archive or can't go into a ar topical archive, it can go into our general archive. Um, the data are curated in the general archive, just as they would be in a topical archive. However, uh, because we're using our membership money to cover the cost of the curation services, the data in the general archive are made available only to individuals who are affiliated with an ICPSR member institution. Um, and so this is not the case in the topical archives because the external sponsor is the one covering the cost of curation. But if you're at a membership institution, um, access is free to you even in the general archive. And finally, we have Open ICPSR. Um, this is our self-publishing self platform, which means we do not do anything to the data that are deposited here to open ICPSR. We do not curate the data or otherwise um, enhance or really touch the data at all. And so because we're not spending any resources on curating the data, uh, the data in open ICPSR are also available to all secondary users, regardless of membership, at no cost in the exact same condition and format in which they're deposited. So those are the different kinds of archives we have at ICPSR. And the good news is that the process for finding and accessing the data is pretty much the same across all of our archives. Um, so Brene and I will walk you through what this looks like. And so regardless of whether you're on a topical archives website looking for data or just on the main ICPSR website, um, even though the branding and the colors and look might be a little bit different across these websites, the overall functionality is pretty much the same. And with that, I will turn it over to Brene to talk about finding data. Thank you, Shane. So now we'll go over how to find data through our search function and different ways to navigate our website to find data. 
Um, so here's the homepage of our website at icpsr.umich.edu. And to start your search, you'll um, click to find data under this tab that's highlighted here. Next slide. Um, so first I'll demonstrate a search by um, keyword and I'll use mental health as an example here. And um, before we move on, we'll want to highlight the search tips that you can find here. Um, you'll find these search tips on the main page here or throughout our topical archive search pages, which we'll learn about later on. Next slide. So some of these tips include our search um, index is the full documentation for data sets, including descriptions of the variables. Also, all studies are described using um, subject terms from the ICPSR subject to source. And um, you'll find these terms appear as search filters on the left-hand side of your results page. And also our search is not case sensitive. You can also search for multiple keywords. So um, here's an example here if you wanted to search Income Health China. But um, please keep in mind that multiple terms or filters implies an AND search. Um, next, you can, um, when you use our search function on a main ICPSR, it does include results from all of the topical archives as well as open ICPSR. So if you want to exclude the open ICPSR studies, you can use um, minus open ICPSR, and I'll show an example of that later on. And similarly, if you want to remove any items from the results, you will use the mi minus sign as well. Um, you can also use quotes to search for an exact match. And here's an example here. And lastly, um, Stemming is automatic, so there's no need to use an asterisk um, to include all versions of the root word. For example, the search term victim will also search for um, terms like victims and victimization. Next slide, slide please. Okay, so um, once you click search, this is what your results page will look like. Again, this does pull results from all across all topical archives as well as open ICP, ICPSR. You'll notice the open ICPSR logo indicated next to those studies. And it will always default to um, show the studies related to your keyword. So um, you'll notice the studies tab is highlighted here, and this will be all of the studies related to the keyword that you um, search for. Next, if you go to the next slide. Next, um, when you tap over, you will find results for matching variables. And um, these variables um, relate to the keyword search and they show the label as well as the question text and what study the variables come from. So we'll come back to um, variables later to demonstrate another way to access a variable search as well as how to use our compare feature for variables. Next slide. And the next tab over, you'll find our series. So ICPSR creates series pages for some of our studies that are related. So some studies are grouped together that are related based on a similar topic or if they're associated with a specific organization or PI. So here's where, where you'll find all, the, all of the series related to your search. Next slide. And you will also find data related publications. Um, as a lot of you know, ICPSR has a bibliography and this is a searchable database of known published and unpublished works resulting from analyses of data distributed in our ICPSR studies. So this tab will show all of the publications in our bibliography that are related to your keyword or your search. Next slide. And lastly, you'll see our ICPSR website tab, and this will show you everything on our actual website. So um, any news or announcements on our website that are related to your search will appear here. Next slide. So since our search produced so many results, um, we can see there's almost 4,500 results for just the studies alone. Um, we'll want to learn how to filter these results so that we can hopefully 
narrow your search down to something more useful. So on the left-hand side, you'll find the filters. Um, next slide. And um, this will show a little demonstration of some of the filters that you can use. So here um, you can see that I use the minus open ICPSR function to exclude the open ICPSR studies. So you can see there are no longer any logos for open ICPSR. And you'll see all of the filters available that we have for your search results. And here are the subject terms that can be found in our thesaurus. And you can search studies that contain specific subject terms. Next, you'll see um, you can filter by restriction type. So whether the data are public use or restricted use, you can filter that way as well. And also our data are distributed in different formats as Shane explained. So you can filter by each of these formats. So um, SAS, SPSS data, um, et cetera. And then lastly, you can also filter by data type. So we have qualitative and we also have quantitative. So most of our data are quantitative data and the qualitative data we do have are largely restricted use which Shane will explain how to access later on. Um, but I'll, next slide. I'll also mention that some of the quantitative data we have that are public use, you can perform SDA online analysis without having to download the actual data. So if this is available for a particular study, you'll be able to click on online analysis on the study homepage, and it'll take you to this SDA platform where you can see frequency tables, some cross tabs, and other analysis functions. Okay, so next, if um, you are just searching for variables, you can do so by navigating to the my, main ICPSR webpage, just as you would for a keyword search. But instead, you'll um, click the search slash compare variables button. Next slide. And this will bring you to our variable search page. And as you can see here, um, when you search here, you're using our social science variables database. And this enables ICPSR users to examine and compare variables and questions across series and studies. And you'll also want to note that not all of our studies have variable information available, but most of them do. You can see that about 76% of our holdings do. Next slide. So I'm using the same example here. So I searched mental health in a variable search, and this will yield all of the variables that are related to mental health. So each variable will have the corresponding label, question text, and the study it was taken from. And then um, to compare the, some variables, you can select two or more variables and um, click the compare button here. And this will bring up a comparison view of the, of the details of each variable that you selected. So you can compare the characteristics of each variable and it does tell you which study that each variable um, comes from. And you can click the link there to direct you to the study homepage of those studies. Next slide. So oh, can you pause it for me? Um, so now we'll move on to finding data housed in specific topical archives. So again, the search on main ICPSR will yield results for all of the archives. But if you want to only search for studies that are in a specific topical archive, you can do so by visiting ICPSR's homepage and you would go to the same find data tab as um, we searched before, but instead you'll click thematic collections or you can scroll down all the way down our homepage to find um, this tab, which lists all of our collections. And this video will demonstrate me going to the um, child and family data archive. Okay, so you, as you can see, 
I click the archive and all of our topical archives will have something along the lines of find data or discover data, similar to the main ICPSR webpage. And you'll click that and you'll search your keyword as you would in main ICPSR. And um, I used Head Start for this search and you'll click search. And you'll notice that the results page looks very similar to main ICPSR, um, just a slightly different interface, but it does have um, the same features as our main ICPSR page. So um, you'll have the studies for the first tab, the publications, um, it'll also list the variables, as well as the series page re, um, related to your search. So this will cover all of the series related to your keyword. And then also um, your filters will still be on the left-hand side of your results page. Um, the filters will vary depending on which topical archive you are in, but all of the available ones will appear on the left-hand side. Next slide, please. Um, and you can, so you know that you can search open ICPSR results on our main ICPSR page, but you can also go to um, Open ICPSR's website, which shows only its holdings. So um, once you go to openicpsr.org, you'll come to find this page and you can search your keyword here or click the find data button. And here I'm going to use the same example and this looks very similar to our main ICPSR results. Um, it has the similar search tip, so this will be useful if you're searching in open ICPSR. And um, similarly, the filters will also appear on the left-hand side. I will say that the filters here may be more limited because um, these studies are not enhanced or the metadata is not added to any of these studies, so um, the filters will be a bit more limited. And you can also um, use the sort by function here with those options. Next slide. Okay. So once you click on a study that interests you, you'll find its homepage. So every study has its own homepage and this is what it will look like. Um, studies from different topical archives will have different designs, but the features will all be the same. And we'll go over what the homepage um, information looks like in the next slide. So the study, all study homepages will have this inf the following information. Um, so I have the study title, the PI, the date it was published, and the DOI. Um, it will also have a project description, which will include things like the summary, the citation, the funding source, subject terms, etc. It will also include the scope of the project, which will include the time periods, the dates of collection, and any um, data collection notes that the study has. And it will also include the methodology section, which will go over the study purpose, the design, the sample, um, data types, response rates, et cetera. And then it'll also have the version. So there will, there will be different version numbers um, depending on which study you select. And this is just depending on how many times the study was updated and re-released. So you'll have version one, version two, depending on that information. And then lastly, it'll have the analysis information, which usually includes things like the um, weighting and any other analysis information that would be useful. Next slide. So that is what will be all included in the at a glance tab, which is the first tab that you see once you enter a study homepage. And then the next tab will um, include the data and documentation, which will um, show the actual files related to the data. And um, Shane will go over how to access the data and download them there in the next slides. And then it'll also 
show the variables that are related to this study. Next slide. And as well as the publications, just as we saw in the main ICPSR search. Um, but do keep in mind that in, once you enter the study homepage, any of these variables and publications will um, just be for this particular study. So next, um, Shane will go over actually accessing the data from the study homepage. Okay, thanks, Brene. Um, yeah, so um, now I'll talk about how to actually access the data once you find a study or a data collection um, that you think you wanna see the data. So as I mentioned previously, Access to data across all of our archives is free of charge for individuals who are affiliated with a member institution. Um, I put a little asterisk here next to that statement um, because there is one instance where a fee may be required and I'll talk about that in a couple slides. Um, but free of charge does not mean openly accessible, however. So as I mentioned, our data curators perform a disclosure risk review on the data that we acquire. And if there's no disclosure risk, or if the data are not sensitive, these files can be made public use, which means that users can access these files um, without restriction beyond agreeing to our basic terms of use. Public files can be um, downloaded basically immediately right from our website if you agree to those terms of use. And I have a screenshot, um, a couple screenshots in the following slides that will walk through this process. Um, if the data do contain disclosure risk or, or otherwise sensitive information or are on a um, protected or sensitive population, then the files will be restricted use. And so for restricted use files, um, users have to apply for access to these data and they have to meet specific requirements before we grant access to these files. So we have three main um, dissemination mechanisms for restricted use data. And I'll walk through each of these uh, in a few moments as well. So one important thing to note is that even if the data files are restricted use, we try to make the documentation files, things like the code books, user guides, blank survey questionnaires, things like that, um, public use so that users can see more details about the data and what's actually in the data files uh, before they go through the process of um, submitting an application for the restricted data. So again, once you find a study that you're interested, you click on that study and here's the study homepage, um, very similar to what Renee showed. Um, and so pretty much, again, every study homepage will look like this. Again, depending on the site that you're in, the colors and, and branding might be a little different, but the same organization and format is used across all of our archives. So in terms of access to the data, You'll want to look on the right hand side here where the arrow is pointing to the note section to see if there are any restrictions. If there's any restrictions, um, basically any of the access information will be included in this note section. So in the next slide, I just have this note section for this particular study blown up so you can see it a little better. So you can see here that it says the public use files in this collection are available for access by the general public and access does not require affiliation with an ICPSR member institution. So that's me, that means the curation was, um, the curation costs were covered externally, basically. Um, so it's free for everyone to access. And then the second point, you see that it says one or more files in this data collection have special restrictions. Um, so exactly what it says, this means that at least one of the files are restricted use and you can't just download it immediately. Um, and then it instructs you to click on the restricted data button. And going back to just the full um, screen of the study homepage, um, this access restricted bu data button uh, right to the right of Analyze Online is, is what the note section is referring to. And so this is where this button will be on all study homepages if there are restricted files. Again, regardless of what archive you're looking at. If that button is not on a study homepage, if it doesn't appear at all, that means all the files are public use. There's no restricted data for that study. So I'll come back to what things look like after you click on that button in a minute. But first, I'll talk about public use data and accessing those data files. So in addition to the notes section, um, the other place to look is this data and documentation tab um, that Brene pointed out. So it's right next to at a glance. So if you click there, it will bring up a list of all of the data sets within that particular study. 
There might be one or there may be several data sets as you, as you see here. So next to each data set, there's this download um, button. And um, you can click on this button, like I did here, and that will basically show you all of the public use files that you can download immediately. You don't have to apply for access to these files. So if a file appears here, that means it's public use if it appears in the download button. So again, this will almost always include at least a documentation file, most often a code book, uh, as you see here. Um, but you can see there's also some other um, documentation files that are available for public use on this study. So we have a measures collected, um, and then there's a report. So if I click on one of those items, it will basically pull up our standard terms of use. You'll click that you agree to those terms of use, and then the file will start to download immediately to your computer. So if I clicked on the ICPSR codebook file this, and I agreed to our terms of use, this is what would basically download to my computer. This is what our standardized ICPSR codebook looks like if you haven't seen one before. Um, so they all have kind of a, a branded um, cover page um, and then it lists the vari variables, of course. So this is a different example. This is from a different study. Um, you can see there's a different title um, and there's only one data set associated with this study. So in the previous, there were only documentation files that were public use. Um, this screenshot shows a different study where the actual data files are public use as well. So it's a little small, but behind this um, download pop-up box, you'll see that there's nothing in that note section that I pointed out that says anything about restricted files. Even though it's a little bit covered, um, you can see there's no highlighting like there was previously where it said one or more files are restricted. Um, and indeed, it says that the files are public use. So on the data and documentation tab, when I click on the download button again, um, for this data set, you can see there are se several statistical packages, um, package formats that I can click on in addition to the documentation files, the code book and the questionnaire. So if I were to click on the SPSS option, again, it would pull up our terms of use. I would click agree, and then it will download the SPSS data file uh, for me. And that's pretty much the basics for how you access public use files. They'll all be listed in these download buttons on the data and documentation tab of the study homepage. Okay, so now I wanna go back to restricted use data. So again, the access restricted data button is kind of your key to getting more information about how to actually request um, access to restricted files. Again, it's on any study homepage that has restricted files. When you click on the button, it will bring up additional information and it will tell you things like what you actually need to submit to us um, for the restricted files. So if I were to click on that button, this for this particular study, this message would pop up. Um, it's some guidelines for applying to the restricted data. Uh, this example, um, it says there are some general requirements. There are There is often a degree requirement. Um, it's often having a PhD or other terminal research degree, um, or if you're a student, a faculty sponsor. It also tells you what you need to submit to us to complete your request. Like here, you'll see the IRB approval, a project description, and other things, data security plan, things like that. This information can vary by study and by restricted use dissemination mechanisms. So I mentioned we have three different mechanisms to distribute restricted data. Um, and the information that we need um, depends on which mechanism we use. In any case, I'll I would click on continue here. Um, and you do, for um, requesting restricted data, you do need to be logged into your ICPSR My Data account. So I'm sure many of you already have a My Data account. Um, if anybody you're talking to does not yet have a My Data account, it's very easy and quick to create one. Um, and they will need this to submit requests for restricted data from us. So once I log in with the credentials, then I would be basically redirected to um, one of our application systems that correspond to these different um, dissemination mechanisms. So these are the three dissemination mechanisms we use for restricted data. Um, there's secure download, which is our most commonly used method to disseminate restricted data. 
We also have a virtual data enclave or VDE. And we also have a physical data enclave, which is only used for a few of our um, most highly sensitive studies. So I'll talk about each of these in turn. But before I do that, I should note that each study is disseminated through one of these mechanisms, not multiple. So it's not the user's choice which mechanism they would prefer. This is dependent on the study that they're applying to or the data collection to which they're applying. Um, and so ICPSR, sometimes in partnership with a funder or the data depositor, will determine the most appropriate dissemination mechanism for each study based on its content, on its sensitivity, and things like that. So it's not the user's choice which option they choose here. It's study dependent. So the secure download option, um, again, this is our most common form of dissemination. There's no cost to receive uh, data in this way. An application is required as it is for all of our restricted data. Um, and again, you get through this by clicking on that button right from the homepage. You need to submit your IRB approval or exemption. You do have to agree to a data security plan and I'll show you a couple of these um, in the next slide or so. Um, and then you'll have to enter into a restricted data use agreement. And then once all your application is complete, you submit all of this to us, we review it and it's approved. Then in this mechanism, we would basically send you the encrypted files for download and for analysis. So these are um, the data security plans that I mentioned for the secure download option. So these are the three most common data security plans that we offer for a particular study. Um, again, these are predetermined by study or by archive. Um, but in most cases, these are the three options that you have to choose from. So there's external hard drive, um, non-network computer, and private network computer. Um, I, I'll skip over the descriptions of each of these. We do have a website um, that provides additional detail for each of these options. If you're interested in that, and similarly, our staff, when you're requesting data, um, can help with the application process of what would be the most appropriate and which one is the most feasible for you. Um, so I'll skip over the descriptions in the interest of time. Okay, so this is basically what the secure download application looks like. This is the system you would enter into if that study is disseminated using our secure download option. Um, and you would basically just click through each of these sections, investigator information, other research staff information, tell us about the study that you're conducting, the data formats you prefer the data in, um, again, IRB approval, data security plan, restricted data use agreement, things like that. So you click through all of those, complete them, and then submit everything to ICPSR. Um, and then we'll receive it and review it, and we'll be in contact um, on next steps once it's approved. So that's the secure download option. The next option for us to disseminate restricted data is our virtual data enclave or VDE. So here's where that little asterisk came, comes into play that was on the previous slide when it mentioned costs. Um, there is a license fee required to access our virtual data enclave. Um, you, as a secondary user, um, you may be responsible to cover this license fee yourself but it depends on where the study lives. If it's in one of our topical archives, some of those archives actually have a pool of virtual data enclave machines. Um, and so they, this external sponsor covers the costs for um, the license fee costs, basically. So you may not be required to pay this uh, yourself, but in other cases, you may be. It really depends on the study. Um, so here again, there's an application required just like the secure download option. You need IRB approval, you have to enter into a restricted data use agreement. There is an additional training that you have to complete before we give you access to our virtual data enclave. So once your application is reviewed and approved, um, ICPSR staff will basically contact you um, and provide you with this additional training, online training that you have to complete before we give you access to the virtual data enclave. And essentially our VDE is a secure environment that you can access uh, from your own computer and the data and the analysis is all done within that secure environment. It's kind of like a separate desktop that you connect to through your own desktop. So you don't receive a downloadable file. The data stays stored on ICPSR servers via a remote connection. Um, and our staff put the appropriate files in your workspace basically within that environment. So we make all of the major statistical packages available within the VDE. So all of the analysis is done right within that enclave. No files can be taken out of that environment and put on your computer. Similarly, you can't take anything from your computer and put it into the um, virtual data enclave either. Um, 
In addition, the analytic output that you produce is placed into a folder within your workspace inside of the virtual environment. And ICPSR staff have to vet that output for disclosure risk before we can then take it out of that environment and send it to you for use. So that's the virtual data enclave VDE. This is what the VDE management system looks like. So again, once you click through the study homepage, um, you would click continue on that pop-up and it would take you to something that looks like this. Um, and again, it tells you additional information of things that you'll need. It has information on the license fees um, or not, again, depending on the study. And then once you click on start a new project, it would take you to the system that's set up similar to this here download that I showed you where you would enter your information, research staff information, um, your project description and all of those things. And finally, we have a physical data enclave. Um, this is for our most highly sensitive data. Um, I think most of our studies that we make available in the physical enclave come from our criminal justice data archive. Um, so they're on very sensitive populations. Um, and this is a physical room. It's located in the basement um, of the Perry Building here in Ann Arbor, where ICPSR is housed. There's no cost to accessing these data either. Um, of course, assuming you can get to Ann Arbor. And here again, an application is required. You have to have IRB approval. You have to sign a confidentiality pledge. Um, and basically there's no electronics allowed in the enclave. You just come in, um, you may be able to take notes. It depends on the study. Um, an ICPSR staff monitor may need to be present at all times when you're doing your analysis or your work in the enclave as well. That varies by study as well. And similar to our virtual data enclave, the physical data enclave, any output that you produce um, is vetted by ICPSR staff for disclosure risk before you're actually able to um, use that output, as well as any notes or anything like that that basically leaves the enclave physically. So this is an example from a study that's in our physical enclave. Um, this is what the pop-up would look like when I click on that access restricted, restricted data button on the study homepage. It would give me some additional information. You can see here it has a link to our Enclave data website. If I click on that, it would take me here. And again, it provides me with information, some of which I just covered. It has a link here to the application for using the physical data Enclave. And in this situation, you would be in contact with ICPSR staff um, to set up scheduling and things like that. So, so you could easily... Um, ask your questions uh, about the application procedure to staff them. So in summary, um, when it comes to accessing data through ICPSR, ICPSR, sorry, um, check the notes section on the study homepage. That's always a good first check. Um, also look at the data and documentation tab to see um, what public use data or documentation files are available for immediate download. And then if there's that access restricted data button, you can click there to find out what the application procedure is for that particular study. And of course, when in doubt with any of these things, whether it's finding, searching, or accessing data at ICPSR, you can email our user support at icpsr-help at umich.edu. And we are always healthy, happy to help you try to get the data that you're looking for. And with that, um, that's all we have to present to you today. We will take questions at this time. And I think you put them in the Q&A box and we monitor that. Hey, everybody. Um, hi, Shane and Brene. Great job. Yes, if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to submit them through the Q&A. I do not see any right now. I know that Lynette is having a few issues um, with her Zoom which is not surprising because she's got gremlins that live in her machine, I believe. Um, actually, I see that Linda Detterman said that um, said something in the chat. Linda, if you're there, could you try sending in a question through the Q&A? We do have one question that just came in um, through the chat, not through the Q&A. Um, how much is the VDE license fee? Yeah, so the VDE license fee, um, if you're responsible for it, if it's not being paid by an external um, sponsor of an archive, is currently $484, um, and that's per year that you would pay that. Hi, 
Sorry, I lost my cursor. Couldn't unmute myself. We have another question that I am actually able to see the Q&A, so that's good news. Um, the question is, if we have ideas for data that could come to ICPSR, what is a good way to reach you? And that is an excellent question. Yes, that is a great question. We are always happy to get leads on data that might come to ICPSR. Um, you would just email icpsr-help at umich.edu. Um, our user support staff will basically assign one of us on the acquisitions team to that request um, and we'll be in contact and we, we, one of us will look into um, those data or contact any leads that you provide us with to see about getting those data at ICPSR. We are happy to do that. I know that I have sent a few leads to you guys. I don't know if they've ever gotten anywhere. I mean, I know you guys have done stuff. I just send random stuff <laughs> so that I hear on NPR or whatever. So we do have a couple more questions. Um, is there a typical time period for applications for access restricted data to be approved or does it vary? Um, it varies a little bit, but I believe our goal and average is within two weeks of everything being submitted to us that you'll have it either approved or if you need to go back and sub resubmit something. Um, I think two weeks is our typical time frame. Okay. Thank you. And then what has been some data you were surprised to find at ICPSR? Renee, do you have any surprising? Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, I know there has been some surprising data. Yeah, there's a few. I think one that comes to mind um, most prominently for me is um, there was a researcher with um, a data set who had passed away um, and wanted, he basically had shared the data prior to his passing with colleagues. Um, and, and so a colleague wanted to deposit the data with ICPSR. And so it wasn't necessarily surprising, but it was just kind of a nice, um, legacy for this person to be able to share their data even after passing through a colleague. That was on clemency, I believe. You know, I see a recommendation here um, from Bobre. I, I hope I pronounced his name properly. <laughs> Sorry about that if I mangled it. Um, and it is that most of us are showing the process. One has to start a submission to show the full process. Could there be a PDF showing all the questions and parts so that we don't have to start the process to see that? And I was going to say, I'm sure that we could put something together like that, correct? It would take a little time, but if we don't already have it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good suggestion. Um, we'll, we'll work on this. Okay. And then we have two more questions and then we will probably have to wrap up. We have, what is, let's see, what the, is there a difference between the institutional representative versus the ICPSR OR? I think it's, what is the difference? Yeah, I, I think I know what you're getting at with this question, but please correct me if I'm wrong. So. Um, the institutional representative in terms of accessing data is the representative who is um, who can legally sign on behalf of your institution the restricted data use agreement. So it's basically, it's usually someone in a contracts office or office of sponsored projects um, or office of research, things like that. So that, those are the people who can legally sign on behalf of your institution. They're the institutional representative for um, restricted data use agreements. So ORs can't be that is are typically not that person. That's very good to know. Um, and then lastly, last question, of course, if anybody has any further questions after this, your the contact information is there. You can also um, this the slides will be sent out after the webinar, so you'll have them on hand. But what is your top tip for someone who is new to ICPSR? Well, I would, <laughs> I would say that um, our website has have um, many resources that you can use um, as far as confidentiality, restricted data, um, things of that sort that have a lot of information that you can find your answers to. 
And then if you do have any additional questions, we are always happy to help in user support. So if you shoot us an email at icpsr-help at umich.edu, we'll be happy to help you with any additional questions. That's very funny because that was going to be my exact same tip. Um, it, we have so much information on our website. Sometimes it can be a little overwhelming, um, but our user support is excellent. We love helping our users, um, whether you're not at a member institution or not. Um, we like getting you the information that you're looking for. And we have so much information, even unrelated to necessarily finding or accessing data. Um, basically for all stages of the research life cycle, we can help with the writing data management plans, writing informed consent documents, um, kind of the entire gamut of a research uh, project we can help with. So definitely don't be afraid to email our user support. Um, we get all sorts of questions and, and we love answering them. Well, thank you, Brene and Shane. I must say that your passion for data and for helping data users has definitely come through. And I will echo that as well. Um, ICPS as a, ICPSR as a whole and Brene and Shane together individually are um, just incredibly welcoming and love answering questions, love helping people be able to find the data they want and to find good data um, or being able to come up with a, a, a data management plan and all of that sort of stuff. So don't hesitate to reach out and thank you again to Brene and Shane and we will see you again. I don't know if there's anything else tonight, but definitely tomorrow if there isn't something tonight. Thank you, everyone. Take care.